after one has gained a lot of experience in meditation, one loses interest in words. So I have very few words to offer you, but hopefully they'll be helpful. Meditation is simply abiding in the self, as the self, in the core of one's being. And it turns out that that's harder than it seems. Harder than it seems that it should be. And we have to understand why that is. And through all the spiritual traditions, three different levels of consciousness have been maintained as being the, the jurisdiction, the, uh, the three phases, you could say, of consciousness or dimensions of consciousness in which we must go through. There's the level of the absolute, the Atman, the level of the soul, and then that of the ego. And at each level, as we move away from the Atman, from the absolute, we lose a certain amount of coherence. And by the time we get to the ego, we are fragmented. The ego is made up of all of these little semiotic fragments. By that I mean fragments made up of words and images that come, congeal into complexes, narratives, little world views of scenarios that must unfold. But you never know which little fragment, little egon, like a neutron, the equivalent of a subatomic particle, you know they've discovered now, they too are in swarms. You don't know where a neutron is. It could be anywhere within a certain cloud of possibility. <coughs> and all that it is really is a certain wave of probability. There's a certain percentage of probability it could be here or that it could be here or here at any given moment. We don't know. It's uncertain. And I would say that this principle of uncertainty is the primary principle that is operating in our moment of history. Unlike in the past when people were resonating more at the level of the Atman, there was a very different kind of culture, a di very different kind of field of experience created when we were in Atman consciousness. And then when we were in soul consciousness, it was a different kind of world. And now we are almost entirely, all of us, in ego consciousness because the collective unconscious of the noosphere is in that state and becoming more and more fragmented. And we all witness this. And the result of this fragmentation and uncertainty, which amounts to an uncertainty of knowing who I will be in any given moment. You don't know if in the next interaction with someone you'll end up being sweet or being angry. You can't judge it in advance because you yourself don't know which fragment's going to come into play. And so not only are we uncertain about other people, but we're even more uncertain about who we are and what is going to manifest from within us. Will we be taken over by some obsessive drive fear, anxiety, uh, neediness. We don't know because all of those fragments are there and each of them has a potential to emerge at any given time. And we can be taken over by it. Does anyone have that experience? And so as long as we're in ego consciousness, we don't have that certainty as to who we are or what the world is all about. But it's unbearable to live in a world where you don't know what the significance of anything is. And yet at every moment and every day, the uncertainty is increasing. Because it's being potentiated, summated by the uncertainty within each individual, or I should probably say individual, not individual, because everyone is divided into all of these fragmented possibilities. And so if we move back from the ego into the soul, there is much more stability. And there's a different kind of logic and a different kind of love, a different kind of intelligence that operates at the soul level than at the ego level. 
and even yet a different one at the level of spirit or Atman. I think I use the analogy sometimes of a cake, and the Atman is an uncut cake, whereas the soul is a cake that's still whole, but it's been cut into slices, but it's all there. And then when you get to the ego level, there's only one slice left, and it's your slice, and you're going to hold on to it. <laughs> and then it gets concretized. Now, it's no longer <clears throat> consciousness, it's just matter, and I've got to possess it. And I've got to get a bigger slice, because that person's got a bigger one than mine, and all of this. And then life becomes a war, rather than a whole, as the cake was originally, in which we are not only able to enjoy it, we can have our cake and eat it, but because we are the cake. At the spirit level, we are the cake. The universe, God, we are all that. At the soul level, well, okay, I have my slice, you have yours, they're all equal, we are brothers, we're sisters, under God who provided the cake. And then again, there's peace on earth at, at the soul level. We are not yet at that ultimate level of bliss, but we are at the level of, of fairness. But at the ego level, no, no, nothing is fair, and if it is, that's unfair, because I deserve a bigger piece. That's how the ego's logic goes. <laughs> And in Christianity, this was seen as three levels of love, which were called agape, philia, and eros. Agape, godly love, divine love, operates at the spirit level. It's love of all that is because it recognizes that all that is, is you, yourself, no one else. We are all one. What's not to love? That's all it is. And it's consciousness, and it's miracle. At the soul level, there is still love, philia, brotherhood, right? Philadelphia in the U.S., the city of brotherly love. St. Francis is a beautiful example of that, that, that sense of brotherhood with all beings. Still very beautiful, somewhat removed from the ultimate grace, but within the realm of the possibility of grace, and through prayer, and through good deeds, and through surrender to God, the grace is realized. But at the ego level, we are an eclipse of that. We are too, too divided in ourselves to experience our own center. We are too uncertain of who we are or what the world is, and so there's anxiety because there's incoherence in our own being. So in meditation, we're bringing all of those shards together. In Kabbalah, this is called the world of the klipot, the shards, the fragments. And we have to bring them together back into unity. And the reason we have to do this is that our world will not work if we are in a state of internal uncertainty. Our world will fail us, and we will fail ourselves, and we will fail to create a, a world in which everyone serves each other, and therefore a successful cake can be baked, right? But someone left this cake out in the rain and you know, it'll never be baked again. There used to be a song about that. You can't bake the cake because you're too fragmented. We don't have the recipe to put it together again. This is the problem we have. And this has been better described actually by the great creative writers of the modern age than by the spiritual teachers. Because the spiritual teachers mostly have been handing on a tradition that goes back to a time when we weren't so fragmented. And, and so you can look in the Buddhist texts or the Christian texts and you won't find much about the unconscious mind and its chaos and its fantasies and all of that. Very little, because at the time when Jesus was teaching or Buddha and all of that, the world was still at that soul level of, of, of philia and agape was real. People weren't trapped in eros, which is desire, it's not even love. And you understand, because I'm sure you've all been there, that as soon as you get what you thought you desired, you realize that wasn't it. Whether it's a spouse or a job or a beach house or whatever, it always turns out, oh, it was the house across the street I really wanted, you know, and it was that job that they've got and that wife and that whatever, right? It, it, these, the, the soul's desire can never attain satisfaction. It was that job that they've got, and that wife, and that whatever, right? It, it, these, the, the soul's desire can never attain satisfaction. And the fragment that worked hard to get what it wanted, 
is removed and another fragment comes in anyway to enjoy it and attack you for even having gotten it. So the soul is at war with itself and it's a, a war that isn't even two-sided, it's many-sided. And to overcome that war we have to recognize the suffering that's caused by this uncertainty. And as I say, it's the great writers, the minor writers of the 20th century and end of the 19th century, like Kafka, who wrote about the absurdity and the fact that nothing works and, and no connections can be made. Another was uh, Shmuel Yosef Agnon, great writer, not well known, won a Nobel Prize, early Israeli writer. And one of his early stories, the Agunot, a very powerful story, it refers to the uncertainty of status of women in society, certain women. But he took his name from that. The whole uncertainty principle was embodied in his stories. And in this particular story, you get a sense that no one, no one is doing anything for the reasons that they seem to be doing it. No one is what they seem to be. A rich man moves to Jerusalem from Poland or somewhere, and why did he do it? Was it for a true reason of holiness or was it to look good? He builds a synagogue, but did he build the synagogue out of true holiness or because he wants to be thought of as this great pious person? He marries his daughter to, some, to the most highly learned uh, young man he can find in Poland. Why didn't he find a local boy? It's kind of a scandal. Nobody's good enough for his daughter. And, and, and he, built, he hires this um, the sculptor to carve the Ark of the Torah. Uh, but the, his daughter, waiting for the, the fiancé to come, falls in love with the sculptor. And then when the sculptor is not interested, because he's more interested in this piece of work, this holy work, she actually throws it out the window. And it's contaminated. And, and this beautiful work of art is is thrown away, it's considered demonic. And the whole thing falls apart. And it turns out that the, the young man actually was in love with somebody back in Poland. Why did he agree to marry this girl? If he was so learned, if he was so wise. And why did she agree to marry him? And there was no marriage and it failed. And the guy's life failed. Even though he had a lot of money, he went back to Poland. It was gone, it was done, it, it, it was a fake, it was a farce. But how many of us are living a life at that level, that much thin ice, because we're not authentically living, and we're not doing things for the reasons that we think we're doing them. We may even deceive ourselves in thinking we're living an authentic life, but are we? Until you've found that authentic self, are you? Are you capable of it? You see, this is the great challenge in meditation. And, and in order to meditate, we have to discover the phoniness of the fragments that want to look good to the other and want to be praised and adored and all of that. But they have no reality to it. They cannot endure. They cannot persevere. They are not consistent. They, they have no strength. They have no reality. And so it's until we move away from this imaginary self that's made up of these fragments. We have no strength, we have no courage. We cannot face the truth of life. And all of the images that we've created, the way we want it to be and pretend that it is, they'll always fail us in the end. And the only way out is in. And so although we say that, yes, in meditation you reach bliss, but you have to go through the sadness first of letting the ego die. And that's what is unbearable to most people. Seeing the ego's own gains. And even though it may have had an intellectual understanding of those games, that doesn't stop you from playing them. And that has to be let go of. And there's a great grieving of the death of the ego. It's not something easy. We talk about it all, oh, let the ego die. This is not an easy matter. Very few achieve it, and that's why those who do are worshipped through the centuries for having achieved that. And yet, it's not a luxury. It's not something we can put off without being totally devastated because life will not work. 
And sooner or later the connections won't be made and the, the things won't happen. There won't be the flow that you need in order to continue existence. But this has become the theme song today, that nothing works. Our ego is even built around that. I was working with someone in a session the other day and almost every word out of his mouth was, it ain't going to happen, it ain't going to happen. Whether it was a job that wasn't going to happen or a relationship that wasn't going to happen or uh, whatever it was, it ain't going to happen. The ego already knows. It's, it, it projects its failure into the future. It knows that it can't work because of its own inability to stand behind itself and to come from a place of truth. And it knows it can't handle the spiritual path. And the only way anyone ever gets through the spiritual path is by being willing to surrender the ego into the fire in order to find the true self. And that's a very rare soul who's willing to do that. Very rare. Almost non-existent. And so usually people don't come to the meditative path until their hair is on fire. This is a very common phrase you'll find in India. Meaning they're in such pain that they've got to find some water to dive into to, to get this fire uh, from destroying them. It's the fire of karma. This isn't the yoga fire. Yoga Agni is different. This is the fire of one's suffering, one's vexation, one's egoic inability to cope with the very reality that the ego has created for itself. This is the hell realm. And that's why the Buddhists of Tibet have said, this is a bardo state. Don't wait for the bardos after death. This is the one where the monsters really are that you have to defeat. But they live inside and they get projected out into the world. But they're the demons of the soul. And they can only be defeated through meditation. They can only be defeated by willing, being willing to bide in the self and draw in all of those fragments into the center, into the core, and fuse them back into the oneness that they are. And that will create a heat. It will create a different kind of fire. This is the yoga agni, a fire that will light up the brain and the heart, and that will begin to make you again realize you are a being of light. And even your material body is really made of light. And then the love will be able to pour through the gaps in those egoic narratives when the mind is quiet and you'll realize that the bliss you are seeking out in the world is coming through your very consciousness and flowing through the very pores of your body into the world and that the whole world is also a divine dwelling place of God's love and presence. And that's the only way we can transform the world. And until we're willing to make that inner journey back to the Atman and make whole this cake that has been cut up and divided and has lost its integrity and feel the wholeness with all of life, all of life, not just other people, but nature, the cosmos, and the supreme creator of the cosmos. That oneness is salvation, and it is who we are. And so all it means is to realize what is already the truth of our being by sitting in the silence that refuses to run away from ourselves. And in that inner silence, the peace that passeth the understanding of the mind will fill one with divine grace.